switching focus and looking at the muscle and the details of the muscle and what actually causes the muscle to contract. So we talked about the process of making energy, making ATP, going through glycolysis, aerobic respiration, beta oxidation, which beta oxidation is aerobic respiration kind of. So making all this ATP. Now we're going to talk about what we do with this ATP and how this ATP causes muscle contraction. But first, we have to understand a muscle or an individual, what a muscle actually is made of and whatnot. And everything about a muscle, how it contracts. So a muscle has many different layers, which I don't know if any of you know the anatomy of it, but essentially you break them into layers, you take, essentially it's like you're peeling an onion. You're peeling the muscle, you're peeling layers off this muscle, and eventually you get to the smallest unit of the muscle called a sarcomere. So this will be a sarcomere. Sarcomere, which is the smallest contractile unit of a muscle. Now a sarcomere, a muscle fiber actually has many, many, many thousands of millions and millions of sarcomeres. We're just looking at one sarcomere. This is what gives a muscle that striated period, yeah, striated appearance. If you Google a muscle fiber, just Google muscle under a microscope or something, and you'll see it. It has many different striations. These, so it looks like this. These striations are sarcomeres. We're just looking at one sarcomere. Each individual striation is a sarcomere. So just looking at one sarcomere. Now sarcomeres have different proteins called myofilaments. These myofilaments are what causes muscle contraction, which we'll talk about. The main myofilaments are actin and myosin. These are the only ones we really care about. Actin and myosin. Actin is usually called the thin myofilament. Myosin is called the thick myofilament. These are really all we care about and we classify the sarcomere is broken down into different segments or sections. We classify these sections based on the appearance of either actin or myosin. And under a microscope, actin is thin, myosin is thick. That's dark, that's the dark and light bands. So we have these different bands. So first we'll talk about the different sections of a, of a sarcomere. First we have this, something called the Z-disc. The Z-disc separates the sarcomeres. It's like what contains the sarcomeres. The z disc isn't really made of actin and myosin, it's just like a different protein. So z disc, okay? In, in, in between the z disc, you have something called the I-band, which I really don't know what it looks like, so I'm just drawing squigglies. But this is called the I-band. Don't really worry about how I'm drawing it because you're not going to have to draw a sarcomere in this class. You're not going to get pictures of a sarcomere, but you have the I-band. I stands for isotropic or inensotropic, whatever. <clears throat> and an I band contains both actin, or actually an I band means, stands, sorry. <laughs> I stands for isotropic, it contains just actin. It's important to know, just has actin. I band just has actin. And now, going in more, you have something called the A band. This is very rough drawing. <laughs> you have something called the A-band. It's not directly in the middle, but an A-band has both actin and myosin. In, the, in between the A-band, you have something called the H-zone. And then H, so you have something called the H-zone, which is really just in the middle. This has just myosin. So really, break it down. You have your Z-disc. Again, if this video doesn't help you at all, just if just go to YouTube or Google sarcomere and it shows you a great picture of a sarcomere. Like you have your Z discs, and then you have your we'll draw a little bit better. And then you have your I band. I band. I band contains just actin. And then in the middle, you have something called, well, let's say this whole thing is called the A zone. See what I call the zones and the bands, right? I am not, of course. It's called the A band. Of course, you're not going to get it. She's not going to give you A zone and A band for multiple choice. But it's the A band. The A band contains actin and myosin. I think of it as the A stands for aniso, which means two. I believe that's what the A stands for. Yeah, and this so which means two. <laughs> the A band has actin and myosin. And in the middle of the A band, you have something called the H zone. 
which contains just myosin. And then if you want to break it down even more, inside the H zone you have something called the M line. The M line, I don't know if she goes over, the M line is just proteins, certain proteins. So these are the different bands. Now, during muscle contraction, these bands slide between each other. This works because a muscle, this is what a muscle looks like. Thousands of fibers stacked on top of each other. <clears throat> it's a muscle. Each fiber has a sarcomere. Each sarcomere has myofilaments, which are actin and myosin. During muscle contraction, which we won't talk about, myosin essentially pulls actin towards itself. So you have this myosin attaches to the actin and it pulls it. So this is really what a, a muscle looks like. We're jumping ahead of a few video, uh, a few sections, a few questions here. But myosin is pulling actin towards it, and thus it pulls it. So it's called the sliding filament theory. It pulls it, and that's how your muscles contract. Now, when this happens, different zones. So maybe you have your Z disc, you have the I band, the A zone, and then the H. I mean the A band, the A band, and then the H zone. This is the I band. Now, when muscle fibers contract, it pulls certain, it pulls the bands shorter. The bands get shorter, or they don't get shorter really. They slide past each other. Now, it's important to know which ones actually disappear and which bands stay the same exact length. What bands shorten? Now, the bands don't, they don't really shorten. Just uh opposing uh, sarcomeres on top slide past it, so it looks like it shortens. But when this happens, certain things happen. Now, now what happens is the I-band actually shortens. Now, it doesn't actually shorten. I'm getting contradicting myself, but it looks like it shortens under a microscope because a, a Z-band, I mean, a, a sarcomere on top of it slides over the I-band, so it looks like it shortens. So the I-band will shorten. The H zone disappears because since the H zone is in the middle, it disappears. It gets overlapped. The A band stays the same size. Stays the same size. So I would just look in a video of a muscle of a, a muscle contracting in order to see this because it's better to see things in part. It's easier to learn visually than it is to listen. I can't really make a video on this of uh, something happening, but essentially when a muscle contracts, this band on top of it slides past the band underneath it, and when it slides, certain bands look like they shorten. The I band shortens because the, the band on top of it slides over it. The H zone disappears because the band overlaps it. The A zone stays the same. So this is the bands. Now, Let's finish this video and talk about the sliding filament theory of how this actually works and how muscles actually contract. Now, in the sliding filament theory, myosin actually pulls on actin, pulls on actin, and, and it causes contraction, thus by sliding over it like this way. Myosin looks like this. Myosin is like a little lever. Actin is a bead which you can just look at pictures on YouTube, and myosin attaches to actin. This is that myosin. This is looking in very nanoscop nanoscopically. <laughs> it's zooming into the muscle fiber, and you're looking at the myosin fibers on the sarcomere or on the A band and whatnot, pulling on, on the adjacent sarcomere on top of it, pulling on its actin and pulling it closer. This process is called the sliding filament theory. What happens is Actin looks like this. Actin is a globular protein. I'm sure it shows show pictures of it. Actin is essentially beads of proteins attached together. This is actin essentially. Actin is just beads of protein. So it's a globular protein. It just wraps around each other, whatever. And now Actin on certain of these beads, they have something called the myosin binding site, which is where myosin binds to actin in order to cause it to contract. And when normally these beads are blocked by something we'll talk about, but they're normally blocked by another regulatory protein. But when your body releases calcium, I'm just like throwing things out now, it seems, but when your body releases calcium or your muscles release calcium, 
calcium causes muscle contraction. When your body releases calcium, calcium binds to this uh, protein right here you know, called troponin. And so it binds to troponin and your calcium moves troponin. And when calcium moves troponin, this, uh, <clears throat> I think I had that wrong, I'm sorry, tropomyosin. Tropomyosin is covering actin, I mean, covering the myosin binding site. So calcium binds to tropomyosin, and when calcium binds to tropomyosin, it moves it. Oh, fuck, I'm getting everything wrong. Calcium binds to troponin, sorry. Calcium binds to troponin. When calcium binds to troponin, it moves tropomyosin, which is actually covering the sites. Tropomyosin will just thus move, and when tropomyosin moves, myosin can bind to actin. And when that happens, you have a muscle contraction. That's called the sliding filament theory. So you can just Google sliding filament theory to actually see the whole pro the whole action and process, and it's much easier to see. But again, you have your actin, whatever, tropomyosin's blocking it, troponin's on top of tropomyosin, your body releases calcium, and when this happens, calcium binds to troponin, removes tropomyosin, and thus myosin combines to actin and slide it past each other in the sliding filament theory. This whole process is called the sliding filament theory. It's very hard to teach this when you can't just write on a piece of paper in front of someone. But it's called the sliding filament theory. Look it up on YouTube so you can actually see a, a, ver a video of this happening and how this process happens. But calcium really causes everything. More calcium equals more muscle contraction. Calcium is the king of all. Let's see what else we have to talk about. The next video talking about the whole actual process of how it happens. And then we'll be done with the first exam. So I'll do two more videos. The next video will be on how nerve stimulation causes muscle contraction, how nerve, how the whole process happens, putting everything together into one, about the generation of ATP and the muscle contraction. And then one more video will go over just pretty much a review on everything important that you should